from Keysight Technologies, and I'm presenting on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Murthy Upmaka. Murthy's an application engineer in our eastern U.S. organization and works with many radar customers. And he has a methodology paper that um, talks about the benefits of model-based design as well as um, co-design of RS and RF and DSP together. In, in most organizations, um, and this is nowhere any less true than in, in uh, defense organizations, the, the baseband um, FPGA signal processing community is often very uh, separated from the RF community. Um, sometimes this is a matter of meters across an, an aisle, sometimes it's across a building, sometimes it's across entire cultures and tool sets. And what happens in an organization that uh, is, is kind of separated where you have individual design flows is that they don't, they don't talk to each other and co-validate along the way. And there's some costs associated with an inability to do that. In an organization that is able to, um, to, to speak, they, the, the algorithm guys, radar signal processing, for example, or in 5G, the uh, communication signal processing, have a hard time taking into account RF impairments um, in the signal processing um, to know what it is that you can really get away with or what needs to be corrected. The RF guys generally have static models of the signals moving through CW or multi-tone and they aren't able necessarily to see how their systems are being used, their infrastructure. And the system architects have a hard time bolting these things together because they have uh, an imperfect way to predict the performance and what you end up doing is over designing both sides of this. So if, if you're able to do co-validation along the way and build bridges between design and verification of partitioning and reintegration and and actually do that integration step along the way and co-validate, you can design out margin, design margin, and not over-design um, some of your platforms quite as much. And you can accurately account for some of these things and, and find the cheapest place to solve a problem. Sometimes it's cheaper to solve it in a better signal processing algorithm. Sometimes it's better to just buy a better amplifier. Um, and to, to be able to know where's the best place to solve a problem um, and be able to validate it is, is part of the benefits of, um, of an integrated approach. So with that, um, Dr. Maka, who um, wrote this, wanted to pose a few challenges. Um, one of the challenges is that RF circuits and subsystems are usually done in the frequency domain and even when they're simulated in the time domain, the concepts are really frequency domain anyway. <laughs> and so the signal processing guys are all in the time domain, very dynamic behaviors, and they aren't able to render some of the RF. And what happens is in the RF, you either have a very detailed RF model that you believe intimately, but you have to simplify the signals, or you go on the baseband side and you have arbitrary signals, but you have very simplified RF. And so how do you bridge that gap? Um, if, you, if you try to do everything in a doomsday simulation all together, uh, where you have a DC to daylight spice analysis, where you have very t fine time steps and you're simulating everything, it, it just takes forever and no one actually does it, <laughs> is, is the truth. Um, so there's a sweet spot um, of the right level of behavioral modeling on both sides and ways to bring some of these things together. So a couple of uh, examples where DSP and RF have to work together, where you can't just design something in isolation and then bolt it together at the end and kind of hope for the best, um, is in phased array systems with adaptive beamforming where you're really looking at beam quality 
but in a system context. Um, PA linearization and envelope tracking, where the changing, you're actually changing the characteristics of the amplifier itself um, as, as, a, as a function of time. And then end-to-end -end communication systems that are wide enough in bandwidth where you have to sweat the details. Because in narrow band cases, you can make a lot of assumptions, but once you get 100 megahertz, a few hundred megahertz, gigahertz wide, you can't just take things for granted about crest factor, flatness, and a, a num noise and a number of other spurs and, and um, effects. So one of the examples from uh, Dr. Mothka is a, a uh, side-looking uh, look-down radar. This is an airplane, and it's flying, and it's mapping with a, a uh, synthetic aperture radar, uh, mapping the ground, doing some imaging. And as it's beam forming, it's doing sort of a raster scan across, and as it flies, it accumulates a lot of lines, and it has a certain footprint. And as it flies, um, it's kind of looking forward. So there's, a, there's an angle, and with trig, you have a certain amount of degraded signal-to-noise ratio or signal-to-clutter ratio because your signals spread over a wider region. And the amount of time that you have, how fast you can scan, um, is a function of your FPGA latency and, and so forth. But in this, as, as you're mapping, your effective resolution is dictated by the baseband characteristics as well as your RF front end, your transmit and receive. <laughs> so, so as, as you, this must be a blimp. So as your blimp uh, uh, casts a shadow over this, over this uh, field, you, you're mapping it. Now in, in software, what we're able to do in this signal processing lineup is first, okay, I want, to, I want, as a thought experiment, to take the, the RF transceiver front end and the phase noise and the PA linearity, um, some clutter and noise, A to D resolution and jitter, and you know, a number of effects, and roll them up and to see what is the effect at the system level on the net result. And, um, one thing that was done was rather than have a complete radar um, transmit baseband, an exciter, if you will, um, they just have an algorithm to take a picture, take the raster scan of pixels, look at the luminosity, take those raster scans, put them out as a data stream, and then that is like a reflection of signals coming back into the radar front end that are then processed. Then at the out, you take that long stream, chop it into pieces, put it back into a picture, and do some more processing on it. So that's just the basic layout of this particular simulation. The first thing that was done was to look at the phase noise and amplifier linearity. Uh, this was phase noise, this is no phase noise, and this is with a little bit of phase noise, about 100 dB down, um, actually at a 10 kilohertz offset, it's 80 dB down. So this is pretty bad phase noise. Um, and it makes some effect. It's hard to see with the naked eye. This is something that you'd probably see you know, in a numeric measurement rather than visually. Another thing is now if we add amplifier compression and get this amplifier close to its 1 dB compression point, um, you can see that it washes out a lot of detail. I'm starting to lose sensitivity. Now, if I go from floating point, infinite res or double, IEEE double precision floating point, to 14 bits, 12 bits, 10 bits on the A to D, you can see that I'm starting to get banding and loss of certain kinds of details. And by the time I get to six bits, I'm really losing significant amounts of detail. Now, for six bits, you'd probably have an AGC on the front end. You'd auto scale it and get it into the sweet spot of the A to D converter. But the architecture um, is is uh, affecting, you know, the the end the end results. 
So if we add some of these things together with low, digit, low quantization levels, phase noise, and, and saturation, it starts um, really s starting to not be useful. And in this, in this example, we've also added jitter. So now, in addition to the A to D uh, resolution, I've got some, some clock jitter that is spatially going to limit my range resolution on this particular radar. So in this case, I have a whole baseband signal processing to clean this up, to make the signal clean it up. But if the transmit receive architecture is not doing you any favors, you're, you're losing a lot of the ability and your ability to architect algorithms to overcome this, um, you really kind of need to have fidelity on both sides. So the next example takes that fidelity just a bit further. And um, we, we have, um, uh, we've taken a behavioral amplifier and put, you've been looking at a product called System View for the system level simulation. Now we're gonna co-simulate with an ADS um, amplifier circuit that is fully biased and has uh, layout effects and electromagnetic parasitics. And it's gonna have AM to PM and efficiency and frequency roll off and, and a whole uh, slew of other real compression. If it's got memory effects, it will have memory effects. Um, and so when you look at um, the, this with the ADS COSIM in, uh, in its linear region and its saturation, um, you get a full fidelity because you're really having an, a full RF simulation with all of the, the layout parasitics and amplifier nonlinearities and self-heating and memory effects. It turns out that, that anytime you drag an analog simulator around, in addition to all the signal processing, you're going to be slower. So instead of a literal co-simulation, if you take that ADS circuit and turn it into a behavioral and X parameter, that's a represent like S parameters, it's a it's a, a representation that's fairly accurate. You can speed it up by an order of magnitude or more and not really lose any detail. The final level of fidelity is um, to be able to have an FPGA in the loop for the receiver and actually exercise all of this with perhaps instrument waveforms coming in on the front end, going through signal processing, uh, M code, VHDL, and C, and then an ADS COSIM, and then a real baseband receiver that can do the final processing. So by being able to co-validate all these domains in one place, um, you can de-risk um, later aspects of a project and cross-validate a project as you go. So with that, um, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Appreciate it.